Thank you, Gabe, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be here, and thank you for participating in this session, and thank you for doing your part in, in your clubs, in your leagues uh, of, uh, of adhering to safe sport uh, standards and managing complaints. Now, if you haven't heard about ITP sport, it might be a good thing, because you probably didn't deal with complaints, but to give you a bit of a background about us, we currently serve about 1.5 million uh, sport participants in Canada. We work with multiple NSOs, clubs, PSOs, as well as um, working with three provincial governments in New, Br uh, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, and Saskatchewan. BC soccer, uh, sorry, BC is a province through VS Sport. The, um, I would say at some point they're leading the way right now. They're kind of catching out of it a little bit with their program, but. BC Soccer decided not to wait and uh, to work proactively and implement in something that protects the organization, protects the participants, protects the athletes and leagues as well. And it did lots of good, good work in the last years to make sure that the program adds value to the districts and the participating and the member organizations. So that's a bit about ITP sport. In terms of uh, our uh, jurisdiction, there's lots of policy changes and adjustment that's been made. So you'll see there's a very certain jurisdiction that has, uh, when it comes to complaints, essentially, and this is not really the reason for the session today, but anything that's a major maltreatment or is defined by BC Universal Code of Conduct, anything related to youth will come to us. But the question is how to address things when it falls outside of our jurisdiction. And what can BC Soccer do to add value to your um, executive boards, management, of how to deal with those situations in an aligned way? So even if it doesn't work out and if there is an appeal that comes to BC Soccer, it comes in a format that's uh, been executed in a very consistent way to the best practices in safe sport. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have Jack Salins here today and um, I don't know if you can read it here. Like, it's a bit embarrassing for me. Like, sometimes when I looked at our employees, at our staff, at our contractors, I have to pinch myself because the depth of talent that we have is, uh, you know, for the lack of a better word, is insane. And, and Jack is one of the leaders here with that talent, and he brings you years of experience in arbitration, adjudication. He's a, he's a judge in the Superior Court of Ontario. He has tons of experience in sport as well as some personal sport experience, which again is embarrassing for me when I'm huffing and puffing when I go up the stairs. But Jack, as you can see, did marathons and Ironman and uh, many, many other interesting things. But most importantly, Jack does an amazing job for us in making sure that the process that we go through is fair and there's lots of due diligence and natural justice, justice applied to the process. So. Jack is here to share some of the information with you guys and to help you navigate through those complaints when you don't have access directly to ITP. So, Jack. Well, thank you for that introduction, uh, Elon. Uh, you're making me blush here. So, uh, what I'm going to give you today is ideally a toolkit on how to manage your own uh, dispute processes. So the next slide, please. And what I, how I want to walk through this is I, I really don't want to be a talking head. I'm not a teacher by profession. Uh, I'm a lawyer by profession and an adjudicator. And uh, I do teach, but uh, I don't, uh, you know, I teach senior students, law students, about a particular area of law, and I, I certainly don't read to them. So. What I'd like from you is, as a question arises, just put up your hand and maybe say your name, what club you're from, and then uh, we'll kind of make this as interactive as possible. Otherwise, you know, I'll talk really fast, I'll plow through these slides, and you know, we won't have a chance to really explore what I'm trying to do here. So what I, what I plan to do, this is kind of my, my curriculum for the day. I, I plan on assisting you in determining if you have a complaint um, and identifying when you actually have a complaint, we'll I'll establish a test to test a complaint, and then how do you conduct an inquiry, investigation, or discipline process? I'm using these words interchangeably. Really, a hearing is an inquiry and or an investigation. So really what we're doing is we're trying to come to the truth and validity of the complaint. So I'll use the words interchangeably, but ultimately an arbitration 
is a form of investigation or inquiry. So I, I, I like to use the word investigation, but really what you're doing is a little bit beyond investigation because you're going to become the adjudicator of the end result. You're going to make a decision. And we're going to talk about how to do that. And we're going to talk about how to deliberate. And then we're going to talk about what you need to have in your decision. And then we're going to explore sanctions. And then if, we, if this all works today, you'll have a toolkit to be, I like to say, I've never been appealed, but thus far I've never been appealed because I really tr put a lot successfully appealed. People appeal things all the time. But, uh, but I, I try to put a lot of thought in my decision making about what the test we need to meet to make your decision solid. So there are times, next slide please, there are times when you're going to seek some assistance from the ITP, some of your complaints may go directly to the ITP and they may assume jurisdiction of those complaints. Sometimes the ITP may send it back to you and offer you the uh, ability to do your own investigation or hearing. And sometimes the goal, I think, for BC Soccer today was to give you that toolkit to be comfortable doing this process because Right now, I mean, some of you may have met me virtually because I have conducted, you know, several hearings in this province around a kind of range of complaints. So at the end of the day, ITP is always going to be there to give you counsel, but hopefully today we're going to walk away with a toolkit on you'll be comfortable when the complaint falls within your purview. Next, please. So mandate. Everything we do has to have jurisdiction. And what I mean to that is you have to be able to do uh, what we're asking you to do. Your mandate is very, very narrow. It comes out of the BC Soccer Constitution and bylaws and their code of conduct. Coupled on that is many of you have your own uh, sets of bylaws. Many of you have your own, uh, is anybody from South Delta? No one from South Delta? So South Delta I've dealt with historically quite a bit and they have a very sophisticated set of organizational policy so if there's something missing in that policy then you can look to the BC policy to fill that gap but we need to we need to establish a mandate because the minute you stepped outside where you're supposed to be you're outside your jurisdiction and really you have no mandate to proceed so the question is you need to determine does the complaint fall within the BC Constitution or your own organizational constitution? And if so, does it warrant an investigation? Is that clear? Any questions on that one? Jurisdiction is probably the most important thing to establish any time you commence any investigation to, or when you think about processing a complaint. Okay, so you receive a complaint. Before we, we think about the next steps, we have to process and think about does the complaint meet an actual threshold? So I've created a test. Uh, this, these are the two threshold questions to determine what your go forward position is going to be. Is the, if the allegation is true, is it a breach of either your organizational code of conduct or policies or is it a breach of BC soccer? Meaning, if you found it to be true, does it even fall within that purview of those two sections, those two organizational ideas, concepts? Because when we talk about complaints, there's a whole range of possibilities, but they still have to be found either under the BC policy or your own organizational policies. And the second part of your threshold is, is the allegation even possible? And that may sound rather vague, but the reality is, is this allegation on a balance of probability, which we'll talk about in a bit, is it even possible? Could it even occur? If you answer affirmative to either one of these, then you actually have a complaint, which takes us to the next step. Is that a question? Okay. Yeah. Or, yeah. 
We're not there yet. Okay, we're not there yet. Yeah, we're not there. This is just, this is just the test. The, the complaint comes in the door. What am I going to do with the complaint? So these two questions before you can move to that part is they need to both be in the affirmative. So it has to be connected to a policy, either your organization or BC Soccer, or it has to be plausible. And if you ask affirmative to either one of those, then you have a complaint. So now we're going to do how do we process a complaint. So once you've created the complaint, you deemed it, you stamped it, now we need to do something with that complaint. So the next step is someone needs to be assigned to conduct the inquiry or investigation. And the key is that somebody has to be um, someone with no real or perceived conflict of interest. So you're going to be looking within your own boards of directors for someone to take charge of this. And often the question I get, what if everybody around, what if it's a board member complaint against a board member? So you're, you're likely not going to be in a position to, um, to find someone on that board that can actually process the complaint. So what you could do, and what I suggest, if you still want to keep it within, within British Columbia and you're not using ITP, is you might want to conduct an organization, another soccer organization, that maybe can volunteer someone to conduct the inquiry. So it, this, we're going to talk more about conflicts, but I mean, that's one of the early conflicts if you're dealing with a governance complaint, which is something that does occur frequently. Board members fighting with board members. So, and the key is when we, when we start talking about this, we can't, uh, we can't let subjectivity enter our thought processes. We need to be very objective. So, you know, I always, I do a lot of small claims adjudication. As a, a spirit court, and you know, if it keeps me up, if I have to ask a question, if I feel conflicted about hearing a case, I probably shouldn't hear the case. And you know, this happens frequently, just because I have a relationship with somebody, one of the counsel, or you know, I have some past history with a law firm. You know, I, I probably shouldn't hear the case. So the minute you feel conflicted, it's probably time to turn it over. Yes. So that's one of the cornerstones of natural justice. We're going to go through all the corners, like all the foundations of natural, but it's one of the cornerstones. And that's the smoothest way to operate is move it to another district, find someone to volunteer that's willing to take this on. So, because processing an inquiry is a little onerous. It, it does take some time and, and we're going to, but if you follow the toolkit, you know, you're going to have a, a nice solid process that will withstand criticism. But that's step one, is make sure that if you feel that's a conflict, you move it to somebody else, another district, ideally. So, example offenses. I left this blank. The reason I left this blank is because I did not want to inundate you with multiple slides about offenses. So, there's a lot of offenses. I mean, you know, and I, I didn't, the, the policy that I'm going to rely on for today's is just, and I'm not going to read them all, but we can, we can banter about them, but within just the BC policy, there's at least you know, 30 potential offenses. And th some of these fall ex right within the purview of ITP. Some of them are outside. Some are tier one offenses, which are the most serious. A lot are tier twos. And then there's also codes of conduct offenses. There's other, there's, there's bad sportsmanship. There's, there's a, a whole range of offenses. And it just, we could do a whole series on just analyzing the offenses. And then there's governance offenses. So, you know, I, I'm prepared to kind of take some questions on, is this an offense or that's an offense? But really your guiding principles on offenses are gonna be found in either the BC uh, complaint document or your own individual complaint document. And then there, of course there's the, uh, the, the code of conduct, the, the, the universal code of conduct. So it really is, so I left this blank specifically either for you to ask questions about why it's blank, but it's just, I didn't wanna give you 10 slides on offenses. But, so if I did, if I'm, if I'm leaving you confused, if this is the time to ask. But there, you know, if you wanted to ask examples of offenses that would probably fall right into your um, 
good example would be coach misconduct. Not coach misconduct to the point of maltreatment, but just coach misconduct. And how would you handle that as an investigator? And, and that's the one I'm going to really focus on today because coach removal seems to be across the country, and, and I do a lot of sports work, coach removal seems to be very, very common, when the, but the, unfortunately sometimes the coach doesn't know he's why he's removed. And that's what we're going to cure today, the removal of a coach that doesn't know. So is there any questions about where to find offenses? Because once you see a complaint, you got to match it up somewhere. You have to find a linkage to the code of conduct or the discipline policy, either BC soccer or your own individual. So each one of you are, have a club, which likely each one of you had bylaws and codes of conduct. Correct? Is that fair? Okay. That's a great example, but normally, then I'll take that one step further. Normally what I see is there's a group of parents and then there's a group of other parents. And then you have the, you have the, uh, the group of two parents. One love the coach, some don't like the coach. So that, we're gonna run with that example because that's a common one and that's probably gonna stay under your umbrella. So what you're gonna do is it doesn't meet the test. Is it possible? So it automatically is a complaint. So we can process that complaint. So we're going to call that the offense. So the next thing we're going to talk about is how we're going to deal with that example. And we'll kind of use that as a theme on what we're going to do here today. Because that, that's a good real life one and it's very, very common. And uh, within soccer, you know, it's, you know, I, I have an education and child protection background. I'll tell you, you know, you see this in schools with principals and it, it becomes like a, or sometimes in the workplace where you have two camps, equally empowered. And... Um, what we're going to avoid today is when the one camp actually prevails, the coach is removed and doesn't know why he's removed. Okay, so that's what we're, that's going to be our, our walkthrough. So next I'm going to introduce you to how to do an airtight concrete investigation. Okay, it, we're going to call it the Introduction of Procedural Fairness and Natural Justice. These are the how-tos, and this, this is basically whether you're doing admin tribunal work or civil law work, this is the how to and to how to keep out of trouble, kind of nuts and bolts of what we're really gonna accomplish today. Okay, next please. Okay, the five minimum principles. Unbiased decision maker. This is where, I mean, I didn't get your name from the gentleman over there that next time someone jumps up and says, something, what's your name, sir? Doug, what club are you from? Uh, I'm a life member now. Oh, you're a life member. Okay. You. <laughs> okay. So, so Doug's example of if you if you if you think you might have an opinion or you feel uncomfortable, you need to move this to somebody else to be the lead. So you can always look to another organization. But if you're a board member and it's a coach complaints and you know you're not you're not invested with either of the parents, uh, then you know this is something you can hang on to. So the first thing is unbiased decision maker. The second thing is notice. We need everybody to know that the complaint is here and everybody needs to know we have a complainant, in this case maybe six parents, and we have a coach. That's the respondent, so key words. Everybody needs to know the complaint's there and the respondent needs to know what's coming. And we're not, I'm gonna jump ahead because we're gonna walk through exactly what steps need to go through here. But, so the right to be heard is everybody's going to get to put their position on the table. So let's say we have six complainants. I would want six statements from six different parents with examples, linkage to the policy of what the allegation is. So that's the starting position. Timeliness. Every one of these policies have limitation periods built into them. So your policy, what you're operating under, if it doesn't have a limitation period, my advice is to move fast. Uh, we're going to talk about should the coach be suspended pending the investigation? 
in a minute. But at the end of the day, timeliness is either following your policy, but if your policy is silent as to timeliness, sooner is better because you want memories fresh. And we're going to try to accomplish this without doing interviews and actually having an oral hearing. So we're going to really remain on with documentary evidence. If we can, we're going to talk a little bit about why I suggest that. Reasons. So at the end of the day, you need to provide what your decision is and why you came to that decision. These are the, you do these things and then we're all on rock solid ground that there will not be a further appeal when you make a decision. And then the very, very final part outside of natural justice is the sanction. And we're going to close with sanctions. So this is just to get to the decision. And then you'll make what we call the post-decision decision, which is the sanctions, if any. Complaint processing. We need complaints in writing, right from the get-go. So if we do have one parent leading the charge on the coach removal, then ultimately that will be the starting position and that parent should provide names of other people that could support or buttress their case. Often you do have one parent leading the charge and often the complaint is from that one parent. But at this point, that's your starting position. That complaint, if it does have witnesses, should name the witnesses. And we're going to talk about why that's important. The complaint needs to identify the respondent. In this case, we know it's a coach. We know it's coach A, and you know, for some reason, this group of parents has now decided that coach A should be removed because A, B, and C. And then we need that complaint to tell us where the authority is for you to even take the complaint. So this is a quick review of what we talked about earlier, but it's more detailed. So this is what it should look like. The next step is and I think we have some highlighted musts in here. So once the complaint is received, the initial complaint with witnesses, either statements or not statements that must be shared with the respondent. So now the complaining parents that want the coach removed that complaint needs to go to the respondent. And then the respondent gets the right to respond. Yes? Uh, how do you deal with a situation where the complaint just remains anonymous? Okay. Oh. Whistleblower complaints are a problem, but uh, we're going to, we're going to, we'll leave that to the very, very end. So um, I'm going to start by saying you can't be anonymous for our purposes right here. Um, because there, there, for a complaint about a coach because of, they don't like him because of this and that. And I don't think, I wouldn't, I wouldn't address that as a, a proper whistleblower complaint. It's just not a complaint that I would give. We're talking about whistleblowers shortly because they're, they're handled differently and there is whistleblower provisions within all the codes. But this complaint, we're going to treat as not eligible as a whistleblower yet. Because I, and this is a big problem in all sport because we're talking about people that know each other and, and you know, listen, I, I've dealt with, individual sports a lot and you know a little tongue-in-cheek but you know in soccer you have six parents that want this coach removed in individual sports you have one parent I mean it's just so it's it's a little tricky here but ultimately there always is at least a ringleader that wants the coach removed and there's often a, a group around that so the key takeaway is I don't leave things hang when I do sports or private adjudication, I set a time limit. So I tell the respondent, I want the response within 10 days, and uh, normally 10 days is my outside time because I don't want this to go on and on and on. Because there's another step, the respondent will then do the response, and then the complainant has the right of reply, which means, and I don't let the right of reply, so we have complaint, we have respondent, and then the complainant will have the right to reply, but I don't let the right to reply expand the complaint. I make it sure it's, I tell them, I just want you to reply to what's in the response. Don't introduce, this isn't the time for new evidence. You, that, that ship has sailed for the purposes of these complaints. And then if the complainant has provided names of witnesses, which invariably they do, and it's important to reach out at the same time to those witnesses saying, 
you know, this is what's been alleged. Your name is part of the complainant's complaint, or your name's been added as part of the respondent's complaint. You know, would you be willing to provide a statement in support of, or, or not in support, or you just simply don't want to participate? It's important to note the ones that don't want to participate, because we're going to come back to that. So this is how the complaint is processed. You're going to collect information. We're really going to try to do this in a kind of a documentary way. We're not going to try, we don't want oral hearings if we can avoid it, especially for that type of complaint. Yes. So your name and then just your club, just so I know who you are. All the clubs in the north. All the clubs in the north, okay. No, I get, what I would do with a witness, so if the complaint comes in, I would email the witness saying, your name has been provided as part of complaint. Uh, I would provide if the witness wanted to see the complaint, they should be aware of it, but if they wanted to see the complaint, I would give them the complaint saying, you know, I'd like your position on this. I, I'm not going to bring the witnesses, I'm not going to get into a large documentary exchange if I can avoid it. Sometimes it's unavoidable. Sometimes if the witness statements are direct, then the respondent's gonna get the witness statements too. Ideally, you collect this before you share it with the respondent, but sometimes it just doesn't work that way. You build flexibility to this, but that's why you're setting tight time limits on all these responses. So if, if the complaint comes in, single complaint about Coach A, and they provide five other parents' names, then I would reach out to those five parents and ask them for statements. Okay, so that's, so that's Absolutely. Okay. Everything's on. They should, so I, I know the, you know, life is a funny thing, but the witnesses should know they've been named as witnesses. It's very important. Not, a bell goes off in my head when a witness said, I was named, I don't want to participate in this. I mean, at that day, you know, then, then you, you, know, you, you start, you're not making decisions yet, but you're starting to have suspicions, on, not suspicions, you're starting to question the validity because normally witnesses, sometimes on a complaint, like the, the example we're using, sometimes you'll get six statements as part of that complaint where that parent is gung-ho, organized, knows what they're doing, and says, you know, instead of slowing the process down, I have six people who want this coach removed immediately. And before I would do anything on a complaint using this fact situation, I would muster that and get the coach's response because the coach might come back with six parents that don't want her removed. And then we really avoid kids at all costs. Um, I mean, we really, I, but it, I have interviewed young kids. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I've done it professionally in my past life, but I mean, I would never do it without a parent or some person, a representative, obviously, that, like the best is the parent, but uh, if the, it, you know, it's, it's, sport is interesting. You know, sometimes you'll, you'll get a parent, sometimes you get a parent's lawyer. I mean, it's like, you, you just don't know what you're gonna get when you do live interviews. But at the end of the day, I, I try to get, I try to have the complainant and respondent muster their evidence so you're not chasing things down. At the very end, I'll talk about whistle. I mean, there is a way to deal with them. I mean, they're just, this isn't really my exercise today, but they're, they're, they do happen a lot. And, you know, depending on the nature of that allegation, um, I mean, if it was a serious allegation with a whistleblower, you'd be using ITP. You would not be attempting to do this yourself because it's a minefield and uh, it's, it's a legal minefield. But there, there are 
things you can do, and we'll talk about that at the very end, like how, how do I deal with whistleblowers? Because I have dealt with them, but it's a, it's a, it's a little different process. No, no, so the respondent needs to know the allegations. So the respondent needs to know that on, you know, on Sunday morning, you know, on October 31st, he's alleged to have, you know, you know, called this. So the witnesses, the witnesses should know that they've been named as part of a complaint. So what I would do, what I would do with the witness is, if the witness basically said to me, "I don't know why I'm being asked this," that would be the end of that conversation. Okay, that would be the end of it. And and and, but I, that's a note that you would have to make as as the investigator in conducting the inquiry. You know, this witness A said, "They have they." I wouldn't then give them the complaint because they came back and said, "I haven't got a clue." If they if they come back that cold, then they clearly are uninterested in participating. And then when we talk about deliberations. I would draw an ad if I have five witnesses, I would draw an adverse inference if every single one refused to participate on a on our fact situation this coach. If I but normally, I mean, parent A, if they're savvy, these witnesses are ready, they're jumping. They're jumping, they want to come out and give a statement. Um, you know, they're cause they have been part of the, you know, this kind of bandwagon. And then on the other side, you might have five witnesses. They're jumping too. I mean, they're ready to come. But if, if I have two parents, 10 witnesses, and 10 people don't want to participate, what do I have? We're going to talk about how to come to that decision. Yeah, what you would develop, hopefully, and BC Soccer can help you with this as a template. There, when you do receive the complaint, you would have a template, you've received it, and you would talk about you know, the confidentiality elements that are contained in the policy or your own uh, local policies. You know, you, you need to, I mean, you're not going to, the reason we're doing this is we're kind of giving you some tools to do this, but it's not something you're going to do every day. But when you're called upon it, you know, you'll have the slide deck, you certainly, you know, can reach out to ITP and there is, he has complaint management specialists that can kind of, you know, assist you on framing and creating your, your templates. But as you, you know, when you muster the, the information, you know, you basically, everybody needs their timeline. So I, I'm a big, I would never go longer than 10 days. So 10 days for the response, the response goes to the complainant, the reponent, complainant, complainant gives a reply that's narrowed to the response. And then I would, ask myself, do I need to do anything more to come to a conclusion? At that point, you had the whole picture. And then you're going to create a, a system to, you know, break apart this and come to a conclusion. And uh, in our world, the standard of proof is a balance of probability. Yeah, I've, 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 in my last two months, I've done two cases as a, an adjudicator with this very same fact situation. And at the end of the day, uh, 
first the one wasn't a child. I mean, he was 17 years old. But you know, the parents wouldn't produce him. I mean, uh, and th there was a lot of allegations. I mean, uh, back and forth of things that the parents couldn't witness. So some there's two parts. There's the things the parent do does witness. So I've seen situations where it's on field, field of play conduct or misconduct alleged to the coach, um, and then there you know there's there's 10 parents and two diametric you know impressions. Um, I have, I have interviewed uh, children, for, you know, based on allegations where there is no parental uh, witness whatsoever. Like, it's just, it's the, so I, I'm not, no, I don't recommend every, and interviewing children is not an easy task in the best of worlds. I mean, I have a, I did child protection for 14 years as, as a lawyer lead, and, you know, at the end of the day, there, there's all kinds of safeguards built into this. In sport, the only safeguard is sometimes the parent is really keen to put their kid into the investigation. And then often, sometimes they're not. So you really kind of, you need to use the, your, your some common sense, you know, as people that are passionate about the sport and what is in the best interest of the investigation to get to the truth. Because we're not dealing with tier ones here. We're dealing with a lot of he said, she said around a coach. So you've collected the material now on this fact situation that this coach should be removed. And now you have to ask yourself, what am I going to do with the material? So the test here is a balance of probability, which means there's many, many standards of proof in our litigation system. Balance of probability is best described as 51, 49, or how do I, uh, more likely, my favorite quote is, what's more likely than not to have occurred. So, you know, when they put these, when we weigh these two groups of statements, what's the possibility of the occurrence? We're, we're, we're looking at doing something that is based on possibilities and not uh, a near certainty. So this is something that every admin tribunal, whether it's sport, human rights, uh, workplace injuries, arbitrators, this is the standard we use to come to a conclusion in civil matters. So, you know, the weight and the assessment has to be logical. And you need to you need to make a decision. And some, I know it's not, not everybody wants to be a decision maker, but once you take this on, ultimately you need to make a decision. So I, I developed a little bit of a calculus um, on the next slide, but I just want to talk about what is more likely to have happened in this situation. So you need to look at the veracity of these statements. At some point before you may start this deliberation, you are welcome to go back and as the person, the lead, and ask supplementary questions. If there's something that you just can't wrap your minds around, because, and this is more when you have one witness versus one respondent, you know, if you need to ask clarifying questions. I mean, often, you know, vagueness of allegations, you know, lack of uh, specific incidents, specific days, uh, you know, th that to me, you know, is, it, it, things that are a little fuzzy and nebulous I might go back and ask, because we're talking about coach misconduct, so it must have been on a, on a game day. It must be here or there, and it must, there must be a geographical connection to the allegation. Like, there's certain things that I look for that, if it's not given to me, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, sometimes these cases are going to be really easy to work with. You're just going to say, you know, I'm getting, you know, parents that just, and it, when you're looking for, when your statements on the complainant side are the respondent, you're looking for internal consistencies around those statements. Like, you know, I mean, it did, you know, it, it, just coming up with a concrete example, like it, it, the type of behavior occurred on a Sunday morning, and then you have five parents that repeat it verbatim versus the respondent side, which, you know, each one came back with a little bit of a softer tone. Then you have something to work with on making a concrete decision. Is that clear? Is that helpful? So we're looking at likely versus not. So when I come to a conclusion, never rely on your gut. I mean, at the end of the day, you are looking for rational observations that account for the plausibility of the narrative. And what I mean by that is you have six statements that are concrete, same, same words, same actions versus six statements, different words, softer words, different actions. Or you are stuck with identical and identical. And then you, have to, then you have to look at the conduct. You have to say, okay, the respondent 
and complainants seem to align here. Did this conduct, in your opinion, breach a code of conduct? Was it offensive? Was it over the top? Was it something that is not... Uh, I once had a case where uh, he came back, and y you don't get this stuff too often, this easy, but this is why I don't coach girls' teams, because this is how I talk. And I thought, okay, well, that, that's helpful. I mean, uh, so I guess that's how you talk. I mean, and at the end of the day, it, it, that kind of admission is rare, but, you know, it, it does happen, but it doesn't happen frequently. But you really need to kind of do the weight, and if the weight's even, then... Your, your, your assumption is that the, uh, the offense occurred and you need to make a finding. The general rule that I use in assessing evidence is direct. Yes? You know, it's, uh, y y we're in a, no, we're in a truth-seeking, uh, this is a truth-seeking exercise and um, proving collusion would mean that, I mean, proving collusion would, you, the respondent would have to come out and say, this didn't happen because these people must be colluding because I, it, it, so you would hopefully have, the respondent would have somebody that could give you some, something you can hang your hat on as a decision maker that these stories are too identical. Um, but collusion's tough. And, you know, it, there is a kind of an old joke in the, in, in the litigation world, you know. I, is it a truthful statement or is it colluded? Like, it's, it, normally, truthful statements hang together really well. Um, collusion is a, a little bit of work. I mean, uh, if that parent group could create, you know, six identical stories. Oh, okay. let's, it, let's say they were, all the witness statements are identical. <laughs> I mean, then I would say, well, I'm going to draw an inference that, you know, did you guys write these together, like on a Saturday night? Uh, and, and did you simply just swap out the names? Like, you know, those are kind of what you're looking for to try to take away from the potential for collusion. But at the end of the day, you, you really need to you know, dissect. Often you're going to be in situations where it's just complainant, respondent. But in the example we're using, you're going to have, you're going to have clusters because you have the two parents groups, I mean, and you're going to weigh that accordingly. And if it comes out equal, then, you know, you might draw the inference the misconduct must have occurred. And like I said, there's one case where, you know, the coach came out and said, this is why I don't, you know, coach girls, because I mean, this is the way I talk. And I thought, okay, but, you know, then obviously, you know, we're going to talk about sanctions, but, you know, maybe you need some retraining here, and, you know, some safe sport retraining. I mean, uh, you know, it, thanks for that information, but, you know, you made my job a little easier here because, you know, it's, uh, you know, and this was not, this was a genteel sport. This was not a combat sport. Like, it's just, a, I just never had, you don't get witnesses often that will give you something that easy to help you make a, a concrete decision. So the, the evidence we're looking for is the best evidence available, direct from the person, from the witness, from the person that saw the thing. They can identify a who, what, when, where. That's really what we're looking for. I develop a little calculus in min tribunals and you, you're allowed to take hearsay. You're allowed to use hearsay. Um, but, you know, how I deal with hearsay is, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give hearsay some weight. This is when, you know, you're attributing a comment to someone else that you didn't really directly hear. Uh, I'll give it some weight, but if there's, the bell, if there's the ability for you to actually give me best evidence, and you're relying on hearsay, and you don't give me the best evidence, then I'm not giving you hearsay much weight. And this is the example. You get a parent. She gives you six, or he gives you six witness names. Everybody refuses to cooperate. So now you're relying on 100% he said, she said, potentially hearsay, because now you have to discount all the parents who wouldn't participate, because you can't give them any weight at all. You know, and this is not uncommon where you'll have parents that just, uh, you know, I, I don't want to participate in this. They might hate the coach, but they don't want to participate. But that's not your problem as an adjudicator. Your problem is to take what you have. So hearsay you can use, but if there's an alternative to hearsay, um, address it in your decision. You know, I, I accept your hearsay, but, you know, I'm not giving it much weight. And matter of fact, I might give it no weight. I might, I might actually just 
not rely on it whatsoever because you could have produced something more direct. Is that helpful? Hearsay is a big problem. Courts screw up hearsay, so you know, don't worry about hearsay because you know th we have a judges sometimes screw up hearsay because it's very hard to figure out what to do with it. But in our world, we're allowed to use it. I just wouldn't rely on it too if I have an alternative. So, key takeaway, no gut feelings. Analyze what you have. Deal with, like, work through what you have. And don't be shy about going ask, back and asking for questions of clarification. Sometimes those questions, if they come back blank, then, you know, you have further evidence you can, you know, your further weight you can either give or take away. But at the end of the day, this is your, you're the lead, so you're going to, feel comfortable. You're, you want to avoid in-person interviews as much as you can because that's a different process altogether. We, we're going to try to manage our complaints using documentary. I use person in person because I'm doing it, I, my, my, my mandates a little differently. So, but in these cases, and this is the new trend, and I, I know your new governing policy um, has created a summary way of dealing with complaints, and it's all documentary. And um, it's, it's kind of the new normal in a lot of tribunal work or admin work like we're talking about here is to do all documentary. So when you're analyzing the information, so you, you let's say you've made a decision, you went back, you, you, you sought clarification. When you're analyzing it, you're looking now at making the credibility assessment. And the, it, the bottom line is, is you're going to give less weight to evidence that's provided secondhand. I mean, but if that's all you have, then you need to use it for what it's worth. But if there was better evidence available, then I think it's time to give less weight. Because ultimately, you're on a fact-finding mission here. You're, you're here to find the truth. You're here to make a decision. And then I, I think I talked earlier, the last slide, but th this is where I give my hearsay calculus. I mean, at the end of the day, hearsay is very, very common in my world and different adjudications. But the other thing that we would, I should mention is if there's documentary evidence available, emails, screenshots, and then they're not shared, if there's allegations of certain things that have been done by document, then that should be part of the package. And all of a sudden, if they're not available, that, that's a question that should be asked. And this is not uncommon in, in our world, I mean, with the social media problems that we have with, uh, there's been several cases where there's been social media policy violations where I'm given, you know, Facebook Messenger material or uh, various chat room material on allegations around kids on kids or coaches on kids that uh, are part of team chats. This should all be part of the case, whether it's for the respondent or the complainant. The more you get, the better it is, and it's easier to actually come to a conclusion. Because you shouldn't be troubled by your conclusions. You should be confident with your conclusions. As long as you're, you, you take out the gut feeling, you look at the objective nature of the evidence, you say, more likely than not. Any questions about assessing evidence? Yes. The respondent should give you a witness list or witness statements. They get the same, everybody's, so the, the key is, when I said everybody is to be heard, it, everybody is to be heard in a full and fulsome way. It's, uh, in these cases, we do not want to close the doors 
on potential best evidence. So encourage everything. I mean, you shouldn't have to do this. I mean, but as a, if you want, A, to sleep at night and feel good about your investigation, you, you know, you're going to tell, if there are witnesses, you know, you're going to ask for their names. Either you'll contact them or they'll provide the statements. And again, you know, there's two ways to look at a witness. I mean, the collusion question is a good question because, I mean, do all those statements, are they identical or are they at least close? Does it look like they colluded or does it look like they all have an independent recollection? Because that's the important thing is best evidence is the independent recollection. What did that coach say on Sunday morning that was so bad that got parent A, B, C, and D to the point they want to remove? And then, ultimately, you need to make a decision. So the last cornerstone of natural justice is what the decision needs to look like. So your components are, we need to identify the parties. And I'm not gonna you know, try to, I just want you to leave here with the bare minimum comfortable things you need to put in the decision just to make, um, just to make uh, the decision stick and the parties to know what the decision is and how you came to it. I am really clear in my decisions. I do not put anything in my decisions that I have not rely, relied on. I do not go through the entire narrative of either side. Uh, I simply say, I am only relying on the facts that I need to come to a conclusion. I am not here to you know, write a new version of Jack Sullivan's War and Peace. I mean, because you'll find in documentary cases, there's a lot of material. Often. So the key is you need to identify the parties and you need to identify the policy. Your mandate needs to be front and center why you took on this case, why, it, why you have authority to make a decision, BC soccer or your own individual uh, bylaws. Um, evidence collected and names of witnesses. Now, when I say evidence collected, like I said, my proviso is always the same. I'm only talking about material that I needed to come to a decision. So if it's outside of that, it's not going to be found in here. But I acknowledge receiving it, though. And then my standard proof, you need to tell them it's on a balance of probability. You don't need to define that. You just simply need, this is the standard I used. And then you need to outline how you came to your decision. So it's a weighting. So if you're finding for the complainant, you find the, the key word is, I prefer the evidence of, and then you write your decision accordingly if it's for the complainant, why you've accepted the complainant, and why you discounted the respondent. I, I don't, you know, we're not trying to make you into, you know, a, a, a min law decision writing expert, but these are just the fundamentals that need to be there. You don't really need to uh, reiterate everything you collected. You just need to say A, B, and C is based on my finding. And I just prefer one side over the other. Okay, last but not least, sanctions. So this means you have a positive finding. So at the end of the day, your sanctions are actually found in your mandate also. I mean, at the end of the day, your sanctions are contained in the BC policy. There's a wide range of sanctions. But really what I try to do is, depending on the nature of the complaint, I try to match the sanction with the best interests of the parties and uh, organization. I, at the end of the day, these are never, I don't, we're not talking about tier ones, which could have criminal sanctions. Uh, but at the end of the day, th the nature of the finding is really important. But the last thing I really look at is contrition. Did the, res did the we find a valid complaint, the respondent did something, is there any apology, is there any admissions, is there, like, is there a need for, often what I do is a lot of retraining or, or safe sport retraining. Um, sometimes a provisional suspension. Sometimes I've had cases where during the process, the coach actually undertook the retraining before I even got to the end of the case because he knew. He knew in his mind's eye that, yeah, if this occurred, this was not appropriate. So at the end of the day, so I, you, when you look at the sanctions, and there's a long list of them, I mean, you need to match the sanction. I don't want to use the word crime, but you have an offense. You need to match the sanction to make it make sense. You're not gonna often be in a position where you're doing suspensions. You're, you're gonna be a lot of retraining. Is, and, and, 
and which is our best kind of foot forward, unless the coach certain, even the coach that came to me and said, I, this is why I don't coach girls. I, at the end of the day, you know, that's just crying out for some form of retraining on safe practices. So that's really what I do with the suspensions or with the provisional suspensions and sanctions is you really need to use your common sense on what you think the, the should do to advance the sport. So I, I'm going to park that and I'll let Alice go. And then uh, at the end, if there's questions, uh, I'll be here. Thank you for your time. I'm not going to use this. I'm, gonna, I'm a walker and talker. I think, you know what's really exciting for me is that um, I feel like I know most of you by now, and I saw my kind of walk and talker, thank you. Um, and I feel like we don't need to rehash the awareness type of thing that I usually do, but has anyone never seen me educate or present before? No? Okay, a couple of you. Well, we're going to Cole's notes it a little bit at the beginning. But I thought what would be most relevant for you, so I'm Alison Forsyth. Um, in your world, I'm the Safe Sport Officer for Canada Soccer, which basically means I'm responsible for implementing Safe Sport practices, policies, programs, a lot of P's, from our senior national team to our grassroots level. Um, so we're in that process of systemic alignment. I'm going to talk a bit about that today. Um, but I also am in the big piece of work. I have a company called Generation Safe, which does sanctioning and other types of education. Um, just so you know, if that's ever something of need. If I do sanctioning education, which I have done during the course of an investigation, um, it's one-on-one. -on -one. It's um, either in person or webinar, so I don't do online e-learning modules, or I don't make people repeat the same training that they had. So I just think that's important to not think that, you know, if you get retrained through the same module you had the first time, it's going to work the second time. So it's just something to to think about. Um, but in my company, I also work with a ton of different sports, so I do have quite a strong aptitude for what we're seeing around the landscape. So I wanted to really share with you today some of the current things that are being seen. Um, and then ultimately, I want to provide to you, which I completely respect, you're probably not the people that will implement these, I think, three or four pretty simple tools that we've developed. Um, however, there's an opportunity for you to bring me into your club environment to help work with your coaches and those that these tools would be most relevant for. Um, so just, I always start with, um, you know, I just want to really ground in these really important safe sport reminders because it's complex. We just learned that there's processes and sim sim sorry, systems that we need to think about. But if you've heard my education before, it's really important that you understand the difference between predatorial maltreatment and the cultural normalization of maltreatment. And it's also further important to understand that we largely think about, based on media, the rule of two, our background checks, we are largely stuck, and I know you aren't because you've seen some things now, but most clients of mine get largely stuck thinking that safe sport's about keeping bad guys out of sport that are targeting and grooming athletes. So that's what happened to me. As a survivor of egregious sexual abuse in the Canadian sports system, I was directly targeted and groomed by a predator he then ultimately, eventually, finally spent over 10 years in prison. I've also been through a three and a half year civil litigation around that particular case. So when I do my education, I work off of real experiences, real cases, and um, lived experience ultimately. So I've worked with now, um, proudly, over 40 athletes across North America that have had the same type of abuse that I did, which is predatorial in nature. So as I'm not going through the education today around that, I want you to remember that when it comes to predatorial abuse, your role is to not educate someone out of being a predator. That's not gonna happen. These people are malignant narcissists who are coming into your organization intending to target victims and do harm. So your role is to identify them as early as possible or to keep them out of your organization or organizations altogether. So the problem I have with the rule of two, which I'm about to go much more public with, um, is that in my experience and what every single survivor of sexual abuse that I've spoken to has told me is that it wouldn't have made a difference. Not that it doesn't work. Ultimately, if you don't leave a coach alone with a minor, sex probably wouldn't happen in a physical sense. But when you actually think and if you were to actually know about what the process of grooming is like, physical isolation is the third stage. The first two stages before that, which is where your eyes and ears need to be open as leaders in sport and why you need to be on the field of play and understanding the dynamics that are happening within your teams, is because those stages are favoritism and personal bond. 
That's where a coach, I'm using this as an example of a participant, or person of authority is creating a personal relationship with an athlete. It happens very slowly, it's very manipulative. Things to look out for, secrets are being told, favoritism is happening. Athletes will be guaranteed scholarships or college scholarships if they stay with that coach. These coaches are grooming parents into believing that as long as their athlete is under his or her team, that athlete will make it, get a scholarship, make the national team, et cetera, et cetera. So if I were to ask you right now a question of, if a coach leaves one of your clubs, a high performance coach leaves one of your clubs, would you be concerned that he or she would take the whole team with them? And if the answer is yes, because I know in soccer we have that, we have transfers of whole teams between our club environment, then you're already running a major red flag for this type of maltreatment, whether it's psychological or sexual. Because what that means is that this family, this member family is not committed to your club, to your ethics, to your safe sport practices, to the codes of conduct. They're committed to their kid winning. And they're committed to that coach and whatever that coach tells them as to how that child will win. Does that resonate? It's really important because when it comes to grooming, this is about the gray zone. And I could get very passionate and very pissed off about I've, when I've seen investigations into grooming. Investigations by the very nature of the word investigation is about finding out incidents, facts, statement of facts, balance of probabilities. Not one person who has been coercively controlled into a sexually abusive situation under the hands of the coach will give you a lot of facts. Yes, when they interviewed me, I could say, the, interview, the criminal interview looked a lot like, where were you, when did it happen, what happened? I think I was at a hotel in Austria, okay? So I'm just using that as an example. Grooming is gray zone. It's the way that the pet predator gets the athlete under their ultimate control and abuses their power. So I wanted to sit with that with you. Ask yourself, do you have oversight? And I could say this on behalf of work I'm doing with Canada Soccer at the highest level. Do you have strong oversight over your coach's decision making? over your coach's interactions with member families, or, this is no judgment and completely hypothetical, but I see this all the time, are you leaving that very high-performing winning coach at an arm's length, assuming that he or she is doing a great job because they're winning games? I know that's not you as a person. I know that's how the sports system can work, okay? So when you need to step out of the bias of the sports system, you need to ask yourself, winning or losing, am I providing the same level of oversight and support to all of my coaches? Do I know what's happening within each of my teams? And this might not be you. I know you have people you work with. But what is absolutely critical for you to understand, whether it's the cultural normalization of maltreatment or predatorial abuse, is over on the other side, which is the power and balance. If you're not there, if you don't have that oversight, you're basically giving the coach the permission to behave in a way that they want to behave in, that they've associated will win them games. And largely that association to winning is based on negative reinforcement. I have high performance, self-declared high performance clubs in hockey and soccer telling me all the time, when I say, well, what makes you high performance? Well, we don't follow blank, 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 we play our players, we're much more serious, they work out way harder. When you look at the forms of maltreatment, what they're actually saying is we're over-exercising our athletes, we're running them as punishment, we're coaching them ruthlessly and negatively and nothing's ever good enough. So that's the extreme, but I want you to remember that you are actually someone who has been influenced by the system of sport. So on the other side, this is it. Your job, your club's job, wherever you are, is to remove the conditions and have the knowledge that could lead to maltreatment. Safe sport is not a person problem. It's not, you're a bad guy, you're out. You're a good person, you're in. Think even 15 years ago. You would have watched a movie, maybe last week, you would watch a movie about sport, and you would have seen someone in Texas drive by the coach's house and throw a brick through, brick through the window. And we would have been like, well, that's just sport. Okay, so this is what I do when I go out and educate coaches. I have to first share with them they're not bad people because I have a lot of coaches that come into rooms with me with their arms crossed and they really don't want to be there because we have vilified coaches in the safe sport movement. 
and we have assumed that they all know what they should be doing and they're choosing not to do it. So a lot of the things that I do around educating our coaches is first of all, having them understand I believe them to be a good person. However, they may have ingrained coaching practices that we now realize are maltreatment. Why is it now that we realize they're maltreatment? Does anyone want to guess? Why now do we realize a lot of these practices that have been ingrained in sport, like running of suicides to the point of exhaustion, have, are now considered maltreatment? Okay, I'll answer. Um, it's not that difficult once I say it. We know way more about trauma than we've ever known. We know, when I educate coaches, just to help you, if you want to go out and just spread this word to your coaches or call me, I do this on behalf of Canada Soccer, guess what, you don't have to pay me, bonus. But when I educate the coaches, I say, I don't go back to 1998 when I used to hit my head a ton. I was an Olympic downhill skier. I crashed a lot and hit my head a lot and I got sent up for another run. Do you think I go back to 1998 and call up my coach back then and said, you should have known I had a concussion? You see that? We started to work on concussion protocols in 99, 2000. And the first five to seven years or 10 years of the 2000s was all about concussions. And those of us that were high performing athletes at the time, we forgot about the 20 concussions we already had. And then we started to do the baseline testing, wearing the mouth guards, getting different helmets on. So when I'm educating coaches, a key point is we don't question physical safety. What safe sport is, is us questioning psychological safety. Because what we know now is that trauma affects the brain through psychological maltreatment of peers and people of authority, much like concussions affect the brain. So I get them to try that, and I want you to all try that on. Because when we talk about trauma, when we talk about mental health, or me with my self-disclosed, proud mental illnesses that I work through every day of my life, when we start talking about these things more and more, we destigmatize and we start to raise the value of appreciation for them. And when we get stuck, folks, we get stuck not, when we get stuck in the not knowing, when we get stuck not knowing about trauma or what psychological safety means, we can get defensive. And that's where I get coaches coming to me for education that go, I'm a good guy, Allison, I'm just old school. See? And that might be age-based, that might be like whatever, but there's no room for that in sport anymore, okay? So I wanted to really stress that with you. So phone usage overnight at tournaments. Now how weird does that sound? It is bad, okay? What athletes to athlete, athletes, to athletes are doing through their devices right now are off the chain. I don't know how any way else I can put it. And I have worked not on official independent third party cases, but within my world, I've helped out a ton of organizations that do not have social media policies, do not have communication standards within their clubs, whether that's parent to coach communication standards and boundaries, whether that's athlete to athlete. And then here's what happens. I go out and I see this team on the field of play and they're high-fiving and they're Woo! And the coach and the parents are going, look at them, they're hugging and they're high-fiving. And then later I get the text messages that went on through, or the Snapchat messages that went on through the same group of kids. So if you're anywhere around my age, I'm 46, I'm a Gen X, that's another huge part of this. It's really critical that you respect and understand the way these kids share their trauma, their lives, their anger is going to be online. Let me add to that. The way the predators are going to get these kids is going to be online. The fact that our guy managed to abuse five out of ten of us that were all living together in the same house, none of us knew of each other, and there was no social media, is staggering. But he could do that in the 90s. The access to the children on these teams now by the coach, the person of authority, is right in front of you through the social media. Okay? So that's a huge issue. So what are you going to do about it? I hate doing this, but everywhere I go, Canada games this year, Saskatchewan games. I didn't do it at our national championships, but I highly suggested it. And based on some things that went down there, I wish I had mandated it. But we need to band-aid while we educate. You need to not have kids with their phones in hotel rooms or overnight. We always talk about dressing rooms or change facilities. You, you don't want to know the bad things that go down in hotel room bathrooms between these teammates, okay? 
Hazing is massive right now. Sending of collateral. I had a situation in hockey, not a case because <laughs> it's a whole other situation with hockey. I had a situation I was asked to come in and consult on, which was where the captain of the hockey team had all the rookies send them a naked picture of themselves as collateral, meaning that if the, the rookie didn't do what was asked of him or her, then that would be sent around to the team. Next point, distribution of sexually explicit materials. I do a ton of education now with high school athletes, universe, student athletes at university, my own kids' hockey teams, 13. I did a distribution of sexually explicit materials education with my son's U11 hockey team. That's how young these athletes are now getting on Snapchat where pictures are getting sent around. The key message there is if, as an example, which happens all the time, folks, a 15-year-old girl sends a naked photograph of herself to her 16-year-old boyfriend and he's on a hockey team. She consented to that photo being taken, she took it, she sent it to her boyfriend. He then, without consent, sends it to his whole hockey team. Legal people, we know what happened, right? He just distributed sexually explicit material. Depending on the egregiousness of the offense and how far that material spread and whether she gave consent to the photo in the first place, he may have just distributed child pornography, which is a, a criminal offense. Okay, so my point and why we need to have respect for these kids is that they don't know what they're doing. And I mean that with all the love and grace I can muster. When I go into a room full of these kids and I say Snapchat doesn't exist because I can take your phone and read every single thing on it, if it get, went through a court of law or a civil case, they go, and they all start hitting each other like, right? Okay, so I'm hitting you with some hard stuff, but I thought it'd be good. So I also know that clubs need support and how to deal with all the things we talked about today, and I think that came up at the end, right? So we can move forward to the next slide, please. So I'm gonna go through some stuff at the end, but here's some updates from CA CSA. I know if you've met me before, I'm not, hopefully you don't see me hanging out at the CSA level. My goal is always to be at our member association level, whether that's provinces, territories, or clubs. So these are some updates from us. So we are, through me, okay, so I'm the safe sport officer, are committed to aligning processes and providing support to all of you even further. Gabe and Steve, so Steve, Steve and Gabe, Saskatchewan, BC, we're now doing, um, we're working on an internal registry of sanctioned offenders. I'm not going to go into why it's not external right now. That'll be another conversation for another time. There's a lot to think about before you put a registry external. But the goal for this internal registry of sanctioned people is so that they, we, well, we don't, it's not about us knowing about them. It's about all of you knowing about them. Why do you think that's important? What do you think a sanctioned person does if they get just fired from a club? They, they sure do. Yeah. They'll move provinces, clubs. I've had situations in a different sport where they literally moved to the same club in the same town, a different club in the same town, and no one knew, okay? So we're working on an internal registry for elevation of sanctions. Um, I'm providing education throughout our CSA, ABC, and children's diplomas. So that's education that looks different. So you receive education right now through Respect in Sport Activity Leader Training. I, can, I have long conversations with Wayne about this and Canada Soccer. I think it's great for your volunteer soccer coach who is coaching youth, who just needs that baseline and generalized information. But again, which I wanna stress, if you want more, which I hope you do, you do have access to me. I do online webinars. I can do in person if the budget supported it. You don't need to pay me for my time. I just need my expenses covered. But I do very specific. So even with our a professional diploma, our B diploma, and our children's diploma, I do three very different education. So it's ridiculous, and I use that word with kindness and respect, for us to think that we can provide respect and sport activity leader training to a professional coach at the at TFC or the Whitecaps, and that's the same. It's not. So there's different levels of education and insights that are needed. Further, what's really important with education is that you're up to date on the current trends of what is actually happening. And that is why I brought up that athlete to athlete maltreatment through their phone usage, the bullying, the hazing, and I had on that previous slide, like hazing is a term that we all think about and we think about being egregious, okay? When I talk about your role being removing conditions where abuse can occur, ask yourself if you have any club traditions. Do your teams have any initiation, regardless of what that is? 
because hazing goes on a spectrum from pranks to criminal activity and death. So when people say to me, well, Allison, if someone joins the team, the rookies for the whole year just have to clean up all the soccer balls. Or in my sport, it was called rookies on the roof, where the first year on the national team, all the first year girls had to be the ones that packed all the skis on top of the ski vans. It was not fun when it's minus 10 and you're packing 150 pairs of skis. So I want you to actually check your bias around this because I get a lot of people defending these rituals. And when I educate athletes who have hazed, I know you know, I'm just going quick because of time, I know you know what they say to me. But can someone tell me what you think these athletes say? Why did you do it, Captain? What does he say back to me? It happened to me? Exactly. Okay? So break the pattern. Do you see that? Just because it happened to you, and that's the reason why 80% of males and 40% 40, 40 of women, females, will re-perpetrate the abuse they suffered. They usually do it to a lesser degree to justify, but then they also want to normalize it so it doesn't feel like they had the trauma from it. You guys get that? So if I'm stacked up in the back of a bus and I'm a hockey player, this happens all the time, and I'm naked and I'm piled on top of all my rookies, and what the other thing I share with these kids is, in that moment, you're going to brush it off and you're going to be like, oh, that was kind of funny. Tell me that's how you feel 15 years down the road, because it's not, because trauma catches up with you. But every time, it's like, well, I had to go in the back of the bus, so so does Bill. So here's my request. When you think about the conditions or things that you can do, so I meant to say this on the other slide, why? What I say to these athletes is, why do you have to be mean to the rookies? Why aren't you celebrating them? Why aren't you, because they're the new kid on the team, treating them better than everyone else, all right? So, you'll see on the so safe soccer, we call it safe soccer now, I really welcome you, I'm, I'm a brand person, I welcome you to start to use that term instead of safe sports, we can make it more our own. We're calling it safe soccer. We have appropriate pathways to file complaints. I shifted the front page of the safe, safe sport page on our website to just be very simple. It's a flow chart of where to file a complaint. Okay, so that's important. And then also, and I know BC is going to look at maybe some other options to support all of you and your member families, but on, externally on our site right now, you'll see an email address called safesoccer at canadasoccer.com. That's an inbox that's managed by myself, Oversight Math Mathieu, who's the COO, and my partner Daniel Pazuk. So we have multiple people looking at that email. That's where folks can reach out directly to me, me as an expert. I don't provide advice, I don't say, oh, I'm sorry this happened to you, I don't do anything like that, but I provide them pathways for where to go to deal with what they're dealing with, okay? Is there any questions so far? Yes? Interesting, is it not, it was a player safety around physical safety? Was there anything in there around safe sport at all? Like mention this stuff or all the? Yeah, okay. Well, it's the safe sport, the licensing of what you have to do. Yeah, that's still, that's still the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, that's super fair because we haven't done this. Yeah. So right now, it's, it's me, right? So, it's, so we're working on how do we get this education out to all of you. But it's only education right now. There's like the social media policy is something that you have to have, but we're not at a place yet where I'm providing education to every single club in the country around what, why you have to have it. Is that what you mean? Yeah, we just don't have it yet. I'm not making an excuse for it. I'm saying that, like, I'm talking more specifically about why you need policies around social media. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all coming. I mean, I don't want to make a justification for why you don't have it. The reality is it's we're just working through all the things that we have to work through. And we just started the A, B, and C diploma education. Yeah. 
So that's just this first, I've only been there for about six months now, so this is the first cohorts. These are the first cohorts that are due the da 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 da. If you need, if you want specific things, right? Like we are not, we won't, we can create the best in class social media policy, right? If we feel, if you feel that's what's needed. To me, what I would feel is more needed for all of you is an online sa social media education as opposed to like the best in class policy, if that makes sense. I, don't, I have a thing with policies, I guess, but my big thing is I want all of you to have stronger education around all of this. Yeah, yeah. Can you go to the next slide? And, uh, yeah, I can, yeah. Yeah, so what you say to the parent is this is the way, this is the way it's gonna be. If it's a policy, it needs to be a policy, if it's part of whatever you need to do to get that across the line. So we're working on this with Canada Games and who implements it, but here's what you need. If you wanna take notes, I don't think I have it. Um, but you need to have a safe storage for the devices to be locked up overnight. The devices need to have passwords on them to protect the privacy of the athletes. They need to be able to be charged. <laughs> so nobody likes a dead phone in the morning. And the parents need emergency contact 24 seven. So if what I recommend to coaches who are gonna play this role, because it's not a fun role, but you rarely actually answer the phone, is that you just put all your players' parents' number on your, off your do not disturb kind of thing, so you can still go to bed and not worry about your phone beeping. Parents pushing back on that, you push back on the parent. And if you need anyone's help to push back on the parent, you're doing it for focus. That really enrolls, you're doing it for focus. You're doing it for the number one reason that we see, to be honest, kids are ordering skip the dishes, they're booking Tinder dates, they're staying up way too late. If they're in a dorm environment, they're disrupting others. So the way I enroll parents in it, it's about focus, discipline, staying at the task at hand. There's also a lot of research, if you just fire up the Google machine, about athletes and how they do not perform in sporting events when they've been on their devices for a certain amount of hours before. So I don't like to tell parents, and this is probably stating the obvious, that we know your kids are gonna do bad things on them and send pictures around, that's not the case. It's not like, well, there's all this bad stuff happening, so we're taking their phones away. I enroll them more with the focus and, and that sort of thing. But those are the requirements, essentially, is you know, emergency contact, lock the phones up, password protected, yeah. And I saw a lot of teams choosing to do it at the national championships this year, 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., and all, I interviewed a bunch of the kids. They all loved it. They're so used to it now, they're like, I don't need it, it's cool. Yeah. Are you talking high performance? Anywhere. Yeah, so I guess I would ask, like, what? Like the kids that are just there for the one time that they'll ever make it, and they want to be at the moment, right? They have a lot of time. From who? From the kids themselves. They're going to go through it and see. Okay. They're not going to go to an event that, to play soccer because they can't have their phone from 8 p.m. to 7 a.m.? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I, under, I understand. I'm just saying that, like, the other thing is, I just want, I want to respect, too, that we're seeing this at all levels of sport, right? This isn't, nothing about this is high performance. I'm not pushing back on you. I'm just saying that what the number one thing I hear consistently around athletes and maltreatment within sport is coaches saying to me, well, they're soft, Allison. They don't want to do anything. They're choosing this over this. And I say, listen, you have to be disciplined with athletes. You still have to, I don't care if you're there for recreational purposes, you're there on time because the things that you're teaching, it's not on you. The things that we are teaching these young people about who they're gonna be as adults starts now. So if we get into a justification around, well, it's not, uh, not a high level of sport, therefore, and this is not just specific to phones, we have to ask ourselves, like, what is sport there to do, right? Like, what, what, are, we in, what are these kids in sport for? if not to work on being teammates, having good attitudes, showing up on time. All of this to me is a part of the overall sport experience that regardless of the level, we as leaders in sports should have the, I guess, the goal to provide. And that's what I always say to parents. That's what I always say to coaches that always are like, well, the parents are just saying I pay, so therefore the kids should be able to do what they want. 
ultimately sport is a right to play, but being on your team is a privilege because you have to keep control of your teams. And if we start to let them, not this is not about you again, but if we start to let them just decide, we've lost all control over creating a solid, cohesive team environment. And what you will also get is, I can almost guarantee you, is you will get a ton of issues with bullying and kids treating each other poorly and because that's what we're seeing off the chain as well. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to disagree. If you don't feel like, a lot of people push back on taking the phones away. I would just, I would just challenge the overall intention of what I hear in a lot of recreational sport is that the parents run the team and not the other way around, right? Not, I'm not saying recreational, but the lower levels of sport, I hear a lot of like, well, we can't implement this because the parents are pushing. And I'm like, well, you got to create those boundaries. Yeah, Elan. Yep. Anything else? Yep. What rules to be specific? Yep. No. So we can, you can make, I'm not saying, so at our senior national championships, I did not have this. This was youth focused for sure. And it's much easier to implement like for Canada games than it would be for the Olympics, let's be honest. However, whether it's phones or not, I think the key message here is what do you need to do in order so your team is safe, acting properly? There should never be phones in change rooms, whether you're 30 years old on the Boston Bruins or you're 15. It should never happen. I'm not saying that I'm telling you right now to go and take 30-year-old phones away. They're going to push back like crazy, but you have to create a team environment that's safe regardless of age. And we are working now on youth mixing with adults. It's a huge issue in that we have like youth players at Canada Soccer going on senior national trips. What does that mean? We're not, we, I don't want to say we haven't figured it out, but it's complex. We need to offer them separate change facilities. We need to do all these things because they're minors, but here's the problem is that there's also athletes, say you're 16 years old and you're playing on a team with 25 year olds, the 16 year old doesn't want to face ostracization from their teammates by not being included. So what we do currently, and something that you can try on, is we work with the minor's parents directly and we ask the minor what accommodations they would like based on their age. So that covers you, does that make sense? If the minor says, oh, I'm fine to get changed with the 24 year old in the same change room, that's fine, but then I go and speak to the 24 to 30 year olds and I tell them and I remind them, you have a 16 year old in the room, right? Let's take it down a notch. Okay, I just gotta move quickly, sorry. Yeah? They found it, yeah, no problem, yeah. 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 I mean, I think it's, it's interesting, right? And it's, phones are now a right, not a privilege because there's no pay phones anymore. I mean, there's things to think about. Um, but again, I come back to like, you have to create your environment. You can't let other people create it for you. Sometimes that means there's a lot of pissed, up, pe pissed off people at you. I've had a lot of people mad at me when I walk into an environment, I say, you no longer have your phones overnight. Yeah, yeah, okay. So around law enforcement, I mean, none of this is we're gonna solve today, but I wanted to also share that I'll be creating alongside some partners at the ED level, a safe sport handbook for you all that'll help you understand and based on other ITP companies we partner with, 
you know, the complexities around law enforcement. I'll tell you what's happening, because I always talk real. You've probably seen this. I have clubs in our sport, along with many other sports, who will use the, I don't want to say excuse, but the justification that, well, the police didn't lay charges, therefore this isn't a problem anymore. Or, you know, there's no, the, it got halted in the middle of the police investigation. So I think we all know that by now, that even if the police don't lay charges, there's very, very many reasons why they don't. That doesn't mean that there's not still a safe sport process to follow. Is everyone clear on that? Okay, I'm not saying it's you, but I'm saying there has been instances of the justification for not just, fi well, what happens, they just, you know, fired the coach. And then guess what happened? The coach went to another club, right? So the police didn't lay charges on a pretty serious allegation. The club fired the coach. They thought they'd done their job. They weren't aware, according to them, that they had a whole other process to follow in order to potentially sanction the coach and have that coach's coaching license removed. So it's just another thing to think about for coaches, I'm using them as an example, of moving through the system. Okay, so there's more tools needed um, around all of this. I totally know that, and that's the world that I'm now stepping into in everything I do, because we've been living in safe sport as negativity and maltreatment and horrible things, and everybody's been asking for tools. So if we wanna go to the next slide, I'm almost there, everyone. Okay, so simple things that we have put in place that have been incredibly effective, believe it or not. Um, culture development. Now, the word culture is thrown around every way to sideways. If I asked you all right now, can you recite your mission, vision, and values of your clubs, what would your answer be? If the answer is I don't know or I have to check my website, then you no judgment, but you don't have a strong culture. Because I've worked with many organizations in complete cultural collapse, some at the highest level of support, where I've gone into the board of directors and I say, can someone please tell me what your mission, vision, and values are, and they can't recite them. So that tells me that they live on the website and not living every day on your field of play. The culture that is happening within your club, whether that's open and transparent and boundaries set with the administration, you're not breaching your boundaries and hanging out with all the parents in your club on a Saturday afternoon, okay? Whether, whether that's um, the athletes setting their team commitments around accountability, we show up on time. If we don't show up on time, we text our coach and tell us why, tell, them, tell him or her why we're going to be late. Because here's what we have. You're late, do 50 push-ups. Now, most of us, especially those of us that grew up in sport, would be like, Allison, that's not so bad. That's just a punishment for being late. Two things that's wrong with that. It's absolutely on the spectrum of exercise as a form of punishment. It's a microaggression towards, you're gonna, you had a shitty game last night, you're going to run up and down the field 110 degrees until someone throws up. That's the extreme of exercise as a form of punishment. Where does it start? You're misbehaving, do 10 laps. And that's difficult, but we have to remember that we're working with Gen Z and Gen A. These athletes' brains do not respond to negative reinforcement. They respond to positive reinforcement and rewards. So how do we reward an athlete for consistently showing up on time instead of making the athlete that didn't show up on time do 50 push-ups? So when you create these team commitments within your teams, it's super simple. And I can do this with your teams, I promise you. None of you have called me yet. I keep offering this everywhere I go, but please call me. I can help your coaches do this. You've got a value set. It's usually, they're all pretty similar. Respect, accountability, integrity, truth, honesty. Under each, you have behaviors that the athletes have committed to. I did this with the national team of rowing who were an absolute collapse of culture, the Olympic gold medalists. And I checked into a hotel when I went to go visit them and the hotel was like, oh, you're with rowing. I was like, uh-oh. She was like, could you please tell those Olympians to stop leaving their rooms like absolute garbage? They just leave stuff everywhere. And I was like, oh, here we go. Okay, so I went to go work with the athletes and the administration. We created a value of accountability. These Olympians said to me, well, rowing Canada has to be more accountable to us. And I said, okay, well, what else does accountability look like to you? Are you accountable to leaving a hotel room clean? Are you accountable to showing up on time? So under the value of accountability, still to this day, because I check in on them regularly, their behavior is we leave a room better than we found it. So these are gold medalists, and I'm not saying they're any different than the kids on your teams, but it's not complicated. If you drill these values and behavior sets into these kids, they will own them. It'll help them become better human beings. They will support each other through it. Imagine what it would look like if every single kid on your team worked together to pull back all the soccer balls and to clean up all the equipment. It wasn't just the new kid, right? 
Member family relationships. I do a four hour workshop on creating positive caregiver relationships, which is code for parental boundaries. There's a term that I want you to get used to, it's called parental harassment. Because we use huge words when it comes to our kids. We do not hesitate to write to the club and say, that kid is a bully, capital B-U-L-L-Y. First of all, we never label children, so I would shut that down right away. We have parents that contact us at our clubs, accusing kids of doing other things, accusing coaches of this, accusing coaches of that. Okay, I, we see it all. But then when a parent is harassing a coach in, all night by text, ripping him or her to shreds because their kid's not playing enough, the most we'll ever say is, oh, Part of my language here, oh, that's just a crazy parent. You see that? We've given them a label, but that's justifying their behavior. So you need to enroll your parents in your code of conduct and your coaches, and you need to be a part of that. I'm sorry, but I've seen so many coaches, not just in soccer, who have told me firsthand when they call me for help that they feel like they're out on a limb where they have to deal with everything that happens with parents and they don't have the club support. Remember, this is not you, it's not personal. So when it comes to the caregiver relationship, I have also seen coaches do a really poor job of enrolling the parents in the season. So I've come up with a methodology. There should be two caregiver meetings at the beginning of the season. One is completely operational, uniforms, timelines, tournaments, fees. That, my friends, is set with an agenda. That is also set in a setting that has been thought about ahead of time and a book room has been booked. I have seen huge issues in hockey where the hockey coach thinks it's a good idea to bring 16 or 20 parents into a closed, confined space called a dressing room. So you have to think of safe spaces, agendas, and professionalism. And you have to coach your coaches on how to do that. The second meeting is all about culture, behavior expectations. What are the kids' commitments that they've committed to? What are the parents' commitments to getting those kids there on time? This is all going to help exponentially. Okay, communication, you need to, they need to involve the club in any parent conflict of elevation. What do I mean by that? Again, in protection of your coaches, I see them go back and forth by text or voice consistently with parents before they ever include you. Okay, so when we get to the next slide, I know we're almost there. Okay, so here is some phone usage and education for athletes. Snapchat does not exist. Anything can be taken off a phone. Overnight, this is it. Deep fakes, photoshops, dating apps. Okay, photo deep fakes is when you put a, someone else's photo on top of a body, and send it around. Photoshopping, I had a case where there were some really bad things put on someone, sent around. Just consider your social media policies. If you want one from us, we can work on that. Or you can add an addendum to your code of conduct around usage and communication. So I want to talk to you about progressive discipline. So for youth athletes, this is what I'm putting in place to support our on-field staff dealing with our youth athletes and conflicts. I have seen way too many times in many sports, including ours, where conflicts between athletes elevate up that pyramid of harm to become bullying and they're not mitigated at the, the, the lower level. So this came into play many times this past year with teams that we had traveling overseas where I would get calls like, Al similar, Allison, this happened, what should I do about it? What should I do about it? So now within, just so you know, within our youth athlete codes of conduct at the national level of Canada soccer, you will see this. So it's internal progressive discipline to deal with minor infractions of the breach of the code of conduct. The other place that this will be in place will be at our national development center, where we have centralized athletes underage all living and training together. So it's a verbal warning provided by two members of a coaching staff and acknowledged by the recipient that if the behavior continues, a written warning and admin involvement will occur. The other thing that it, with minors is in the first stage of a verbal warning, we don't involve the parents. Once the parents are involved, I'm sure we've all had experiences where things get blown up really quickly once you involve the parents. So we always give our athletes a first-hand opportunity to be clear on what they've done that we don't like that they have an opportunity to shift their behavior. They do not shift their behavior. We're providing a written warning. We're involving who we need to from the club or from the association. And we're having a meeting with the parents. That's strike two. Strike three, suspension or expulsion from our programming or from the event. Does that make sense? It's a lot. I had a very short period of time. But I hope that's somewhat helpful. It's a lot of information, but I wanted to give you sort of some of the top things that we've been seeing 
what we're working on. I'm open to all feedback. My email directly is aforsyth at canadasoccer.com. Um, but again, I highly encourage you to dig into what could happen before. We need to get out further into the prevention of all this, which for the record is not going to probably live in a policy. It's going to live in what you create and what you're watching out for on your fields of play. All right, that's it. Thank you.